And I'm going to um, start with um, uh, Dr. Uh, Davis and anyone else who'd like to jump in uh, with uh, answers to these questions, you're welcome to do so. Could calcium channel blockers treat electrohypersensitivity symptoms uh, such as tachycardia uh, with electromagnetic field exposure? Let me just say that that's a very interesting uh, theory and I believe that there are some clinicians that are moving in that direction. It was suggested by Martin Paul some time ago and um, I think that that makes uh, some sense. Uh, uh, would anyone else like to hop in who, for example, Dr. Baldwin, who actually treats patients? Um, well, calcium channel blockers are not something that we typically use in neurosurgery other than to control blood pressure. Um, but certainly um, that's something that could be considered. Um, but I, I'm, I'm not familiar in terms of treating EHS patients with a calcium channel blocker. Thank you. Dr. Teo, are there studies looking at use of Bluetooth audio devices and acoustic or other brain tumors? Uh, the short answer is yes. The long answer is that uh, there are almost as many uh, studies to show no link as there are to show a link. Uh, and I didn't come up with any sort of objective conclusion. So if you don't mind, I'd rather not make a statement on that. I'll simply say this, that uh, there is consensus that the more you reduce your exposure to EMF, uh, the better. Uh, and everyone says that. In fact, the, the little pamphlets that come with when you buy a phone says you should try and keep your phone a, a certain distance away from your head. So no one disputes that. And so any mechanism by which you can keep your phone away from your head is said to be beneficial, whether it be Bluetooth, uh, a, a cord, a, a wire cord, uh, or a uh, or loudspeaker. So basically what I tell people is just keep it one arm's length away from your head uh, until the jury is in, uh, so that uh, at least you can reduce the amount of EMR exposure, uh, ne sorry, near field exposure. Thank I'd you. Like, I'd like to comment on that. Um, just to echo what Dr. Teo said, um, we're living that experiment. And we are experiencing the largest unethical medical experiment in human history to quote Ronald Costa, PhD from the School of Public Policy at Georgia Institute of Technology. So we're living these things and we'll be able to track them because we have a surveillance society. And almost no one now comes into my clinic with either a spine problem or brain tumor and Dr. Teo can probably confirm that who's not wearing an iWatch or other Bluetooth device, despite the signs in my waiting room, the signs in my hallway, uh, many people uh, from 65 and up fumble and have no awareness of how to disable their phone. And so um, we're living that experiment right now. And it's the largest unethical experiment in human history. And, you know, we did not get a chance to complete the discussion that uh, Dr. Lai and I uh, began because we ran out of time, but he's absolutely right. We don't have the definitive, undebatable epidemiologic evidence at this point. But I think your point, Dr. Baldwin, is that if we're trying to prevent harm, then we know enough now to take steps to do that. And I think I'm, I'm very grateful to Charlie Teo for his leadership on this issue, not only in Australia, but for the world because your statement has now literally traveled around the world many times. Uh, because what you say is, look, I know enough as a physician, as a surgeon to look at the data and say, this is a problem. And while we can debate the quality of the data and it's whether or not it's definitive or not, uh, if we wait for the kinds of data that we insisted upon for tobacco, it will unfortunately be even worse of an epidemic than we faced with tobacco. Okay, this is, uh, did you wanna say something, uh, Dr. Baldwin? No, it's, it's correct. And, and Dr. Teo mentioned um, the latency in Hardell studies of 10 years, but then let's look at the latencies of 20 and 30 and 40 years. And the number of numerical cases of, of glioblastoma and other potential malignant tumors now, uh, central nervous system lymphoma now that has been questioned in the uh, Swedish literature just this within the last calendar year as a hypothesis, but showing increase in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, we are again uh, living that experiment. 
This is to um, uh, any of the presenters. Have you seen an increase in bladder cancer as a result of the low level work exposures to electromagnetic fields? I have several patients at the same place of work, which is a technical um, uh, place that have bladder cancer. Would anyone like to comment on that? Well, our modeling studies that we've done with our colleagues in Porto Alegre, Brazil, have modeled the lower abdomen of young men. And you can see, in, and those models are available on our website at ehtrust.org. And you can see that the greatest exposure is, is into the penis and substantial exposure gets, of course, into the soft tissue because there's nothing to protect it. There's no large, thick skull as you have with, with the head. So you're getting exposure into the rectum, exposure into the bladder, exposure in, into even to the prostate. So there's, it's plausible, I would say, it's plausible that there could be a link and again, uh, I hope we don't find definitive data by the time we take steps to reduce exposures. Thank you. Um, this is once again for anyone who'd like to answer. Considering the naturally occurring electromagnetic radiation from cosmic rays, certain mineral, minerals in the ground and from ultraviolet radiation, to name the ones I've heard of, is the radiation we get from Wi-Fi, for example, much greater than the combined exposure of these naturally occurring electromagnetic radiation um, that have been that have evolved over time? Who would like to answer that, or start with an answer? I think Why? it's an excellent question, but uh, but I'm not an expert on exposure to uh, EMR and and its various sources. I simply know this that there are people around. So, uh, uh, engineers who come to your house and assess the amount of exposure that you get. Uh, and it is surprising because they always come to me with the, uh, the end result and the test results. And it's surprising to me that you do get a lot of exposure from uh, sources that you're not completely aware of. Like for example, the fuse box that sits on the outside of your house uh, has a lot of EMR generated on the other side of the wall. So if you have your bed uh, on the other side of the wall to a fuse box, you're getting quite a bit of exposure. Uh, wires in the wall, uh, uh, alarm clocks next to your bed, uh, electric heating blankets that are left on at night all emit EMR. So you'll be surprised at how much EMR you're exposed to on a, on a daily basis, uh, as well as, of course, of the uh, uh, mobile phones and the microwaves. Of course, it's important to differentiate between the low level electromagnetic fields that you just described, Dr. Teo, and the radio frequency exposures that we get currently from cell phones, Wi-Fi's, baby monitors and the like, and the newer exposures that are projected to occur if and when 5G becomes more than an experiment in football stadiums, which is currently in the United States, we're starting to roll it out, unfortunately, in many urban areas. Anyone else? Perhaps I can, sorry, go ahead. Oh, well, in, in, in terms of Wi-Fi, and we've already discussed this with some of the other presenters, it's, it's, the, it's the pulsations and the frequency. And so that natural uh, background radiation, such, such as the Schumann resonance, that's you know, our natural Earth's electronic field, is something that's healthy. But information data packets that are traveling over four and 5G waves and Wi-Fi waves are truly deleterious. And, and this is one of the theories of the deleterious effects of baby monitors is that, is that causative for autism in terms of those young brains are so sensitive and their skulls are so thin that those data packets traveling on their Wi-Fi data monitors are in effect stifling those children's normal cries and they go inward. And, and this could be real. And I, I, I would venture to say it's probably potentially very real. While we focus primarily on cell phones during this, um, these presentations, we've got Wi-Fi, we've got Bluetooth, we've got people living near cell phone towers, we've got baby monitors, we've got wireless games, you know, wireless computers, wireless uh, mouse, wireless keyboard. Of all of the types of exposures that we have, uh, which, in your opinion, would be the uh, most harmful in terms of the total amount of exposure from these artificial man-made sources. Who would like to start? Well, we know from modeling studies, again, done by Claudio Fernandez and Alvaro de Salas, whom you know very well, Dr. Havas, that the greatest exposure occurs 
from the cell phone. It's the device that's held directly next to the body. It gives you the near field exposure that Dr. Teo just referenced. And because of that, the greatest exposure that any individual will have will be from the phone. Now, even if the phone is not being used as a phone, so long as it's on and in your pocket next to your body, it's emitting signals up to 900 times a minute. It's the electronic handshake. Where are you? Here I am. Where are you? Here I am. So that it's smart and it's constantly updating itself with however many apps you might have open. So get it off your body. Remember, distance is your friend. Uh, from Actually, from uh, surveys, the EMF, the radio frequency radiation in the environment, come from AM, FM radio and TV stations. So we are actually exposed people, whole body, to the radiation. And that, uh, there are of course, study that show that uh, how far people live from a tower, from an AM uh, radio tower or TV tower, they are increasing cancer the closer they are to the towers. But these people are exposed whole body to the radiation instead of uh, partially uh, exposure like uh, cell phones. In small communities, one of the things we found is that the highest exposure comes um, not from nearby cell towers, but primarily from Wi-Fi in the home. So, you know, if you have this on all the time, um, it's near your bedroom, you're going to be exposed 24 seven. Um, and so I guess if I had to answer that question, I would have thought Wi-Fi um, would be very up high on that list, um, maybe even higher than cell phones, just because you've got full body exposure, you know, 24 seven, if you happen to have it on all the time. Exactly. Dr. Teo, um, we think of gliomas as, an, as a, um, a tumor of elderly people. Are younger people, beginning to develop this? Are you finding that in your practice? And I guess, uh, Dr. Baldwin, that would apply to you as well. Are you noticing that there's an age differentiation in, in um, um, uh, brain tumors in, in men and women or in either sex? Yeah, there's a real uh, instance of brain cancer, brain tumors in children. I mean, it's an often not well-known fact that uh, brain cancer is the number one killer of children in our society in developed countries. It kills more children than any other cancer, kills more children than any other disease. Uh, so it's the most solid, uh, most common solid cancer in kids. It's the deadliest cancer in kids. Uh, but that wasn't your question. I, I wanted to make that statement so you do understand that it is a tumor that is unfortunately in our children. Um, the answer, the question is, you know, is the instance of brain cancer, brain tumors increasing in children? And I hate to say it, but the scientific community are loggerheads and still haven't come up with a definitive statement. The UK came up with a definitive statement saying that one particular tumor was absolutely mm -hmm. increasing in incidence in children. That's a tumor called an ependymoma. And as I said to you before, the CB Trust studies that showed some exponential rise in brain cancer in 19 US states included children in those figures. So uh, I guess the uh, bottom line is yes, it's increasing in adults and in children. And uh, is it increasing in children more than adults? Well, for this one particular tumor it is. Uh, so, uh, I mean, there's enough evidence there to be worried. We haven't talked about thyroid cancer, but that seems to be increasing, particularly among women in a lot of developed countries. Would any of you care to comment on that? Is that due simply to you know, improved methods of detection or is it a real increase? Epidemiologists, again, are split on this. There's no question that a large part of the increase in thyroid cancer is diagnostic ascertainment. We have improved our ability to look for it. The more we look, the more we find. Having said that, Leonard Hardell and colleagues just produced, I think, a very important analysis that I, to me is very persuasive that there is a real increase in thyroid cancer, particularly in younger people, and that it's increasing among children who normally do not get thyroid cancer. So again, 
um, of the argument is, well, that's just a diagnostic ascertainment. Now, I don't think so. I don't know if um, um, whether it's, it's worthwhile to note that the Centers for Disease Control actually has produced a report on this where they say they think there's a real increase in thyroid cancer. And they also note, by the way, a possible increase in glioma, which as you know, is the kind of brain cancer we're most concerned about associating mm -hmm. uh, with, with uh, cell phone radiation. The, the Yale study was just published within the last calendar year confirming um, that exact incidence of thyroid cancer. And that also segues into the increased incidence of um, salivary, salivary gland tumors uh, in and around the jaw um, that's also on the increase. Uh, Hardell's earlier study from 2011 looking at case controlled groups of people that just started using the cell phone above age 20 showed a doubling of glioma incidence. And so if we refer back to that data, it's there and I am living it. There's no question that I am seeing uh, 20 and 30 year olds come in with um, GBM that Dr. Teo mentioned. Uh, I'm sure the picture that he showed uh, was one of his younger patients. Um, and, and sadly, you know, no matter how elegant an operation we do and a resection, um, the, and, and, and we have all the latest and greatest technologies for you know, looking at tumor cells and immunotherapy, um, the end result is still very depressing. But the incidence in lower and younger people is definitely a phenomenon that I see, even though we're all getting older as clinicians and people naturally mm -hmm. look younger, <laughs> It, it is, it's quite concerning when you see someone come in with a GBM and, and it's their first manifestation of any illness at all. And they're, you know, they're a 30 something with a young family and it's devastating. And we saw the same thing with the rectal cancer patterns. I mean, a quadrupling of rectal cancer in under age 40 in the United States. Now this is a rare cancer, but they don't even look for it anymore. What they've done as a consequence of this is now to lower the age for screening for colorectal cancer because it's increased so much. So even though it's relatively rare, it's, it's really increased quite a, quite a lot and no one has offered any other explanation for this. A lot of the uh, research that we have is on glioblastoma and I agree that's you know the most powerful information. What about meningiomas as a type of tumor in the brain? Yeah, meningiomas have also been mentioned in the same uh, sentence in the same studies as uh, gliomas. Uh, I don't think the evidence is as compelling for meningiomas. Uh, the substrate, the bio, biological substrate of the genesis of a meningioma isn't quite in keeping with some of the studies that we, basic science studies that we've seen. So uh, uh, both acoustic neuromas and meningiomas, well, they have been associated with mobile phone usage. Uh, but uh, I think the most compelling evidence is gliomas. Another, interesting trend, oh, another yep. interesting trend, and again, I, at, the, at the risk of being anecdotal, because that's not something that we as, as good research clinicians want to talk about, but um, I have noticed an increase in infection rates in, in perioperative uh, craniotomy patients. Um, and, and if you query you know, the people that come in with those infections, their primary mode of communication is a cell phone. Of course, most, most people's primary mode of communication now is a cell phone and no one has a landline. But I've, I've noticed a, a scary trend in, in post-operative wound infections um, and bacterial growth. And I think we're gonna hear about that later in this conference from Dr. Goldberg. And so even Gunnar Hauser has you know, his opinion on that in terms of perioperative healing and exposure to the cell phone. Charlie, have you noticed anything in that vein at all? No. No, sorry, I haven't, yeah. Okay. Now, there's been some questions about ultrasound and successful pregnancies. Do any of you want to comment on, on that, having too many ultrasounds perhaps while you're pregnant? No, it's I don't even know there. what, uh, I don't yeah. know the frequency of radiation that comes out of an ultrasound. I'm sorry, I, I'm not an expert on that. No, it's, it is definitely um, a lower frequency, um, but there are concerns that have been expressed in the obstetrical community. And there's generally a move to do fewer ultrasounds as a, as a result of the possibility. And again, I would say that we have to ask ourselves the question, do you want to prove harm or prevent it? Mm -hmm. 
Now, would any of you uh, on the panel be interested in using your influence to alert colleges and universities about radio frequency radiation exposure on campuses? Or has anyone you know of already begun to done, do so? We at Environmental Health Trust have a very active program of working with parents and teachers at the level of middle school, elementary school, as well as move up to high school, wherever we have been asked to do so. But as you know very well, Dr. Havas, from your own leadership and pioneering experience in this field, uh, it, you're kind of like the skunk at the garden party because so many institutions regard this as an entitlement that's revolutionizing education. And there's no denying that during the pandemic, uh, children of all ages are spending more and more hours in front of th these devices. And although I can tell you that if you use it wired as I do now, your connection's mm -hmm. safer, it's more secure, and you also are, are prevented from hacking. And you, Dr. Havis, are one of the first people in the world to tell me about this. So I want to thank you publicly for your leadership on this. It's a tough one. And there does need to be more of a national campaign uh, to do that. And I would welcome those who are part of this conference afterwards. Please go to our booth. Please help us figure out ways to do this because we're not anti-technology. We realize there are many, many advantages of it. And most of us are geeks ourselves. We just want it to be used as safely as possible. And we think that advances, advances in software and hardware are gonna make it much, much better. No, I'd just like to say that I've, I've respected Deborah for many, many decades now. She is a brilliant speaker, a great scientist, and I think I would like to underscore her last statement. And the last statement is very simple. We're not radicals. We're not extremists. We're not anti-technology. We are simply concerned citizens who believe there's enough literature out there for people to be aware of it and to mitigate risk. And to mitigate risk means to reduce exposure to EMR. It's very simple. Uh, and, you know, I hate the way we are, we are radicalised. We're, you know, we're, we're thought to be radical simply because we're making these statements in the best interests of, of society and community. We're not radicals, and I'm not a radical. I'm not even an expert in EMR. I'm simply a concerned citizen who sees how deadly brain cancer is. And if there's any way we can reduce the risk of developing brain cancer, uh, then we should at least keep our minds open, our ears open, and continue uh, treating these studies as uh, potential, uh, you know, information highways that will then influence which direction we go in. Uh, so Deborah's always said that, and I think it's a, you know, what's wrong with us saying that? There's nothing wrong with saying, you know, be uh, be concerned until the uh, jury is in. <laughs>